those nice applause. Um, a little bit more about myself. I like anything outdoors, basically. I live in Knivsta. Uh, I got two kids, one wife. I live in a <laughs> small house with a big unkept garden. Um, uh, that's, that's basically me. Uh, I work in the uh, Uppsala office with nine monkeys there, um, divided in two teams. It might be two and a half, three teams, depends on how you see it and how you look at the future. Uh, there's um, one team called Bill. They uh, manage the Hadoop infrastructure. And uh, then we have another team called Bull. And we write uh, application support on the Hadoop infrastructure. Structure. Um, this is the Uppsala office. We do a lot of Java. Uh, some guys working. And we have some operational stuff over there. A very nice entrance as well. Please come visit us. We have Fika twice a day, basically. <laughs> so you're very, very much welcome. All right, so let's look at the agenda. Uh, today we're going to look at why we need an architecture for processing data. Uh, why don't we just use a regular Postgres or whatever? Uh, we're going to look a bit uh, on the underlying um, theorem of the problem, the CAP theorem, uh, then look at the Lambda architecture, uh, then what we do with Lambda at Klarna. Uh, if we have time, we move into a specific uh, problem that we solved here at Klarna. And um, <clears throat> after that, we look at the CAP architecture, which is a runner-up in these processing architectures. A small CAP case study was re a bit hard to actually find a good case study, but I found a, a drawing anyway. We're going to look at it. Uh, and then we're having a sort of a face-off between these two architectures uh, at the end of it. So, but why do we really need an architecture for data processing? Why, why can't us, I just take my Postgres or, or an arbitrary NoSQL database and use that one as my, as my data storage and processing layer? Well, it works fairly well as a startup when, you, when your data set is small and your, 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 your data rate isn't that high. But once you start adding requirements, start adding customers, uh, start adding traffic, uh, you all know it, it stops working. It, it sort of grinds to a halt eventually. Uh, someone wants to, wants to use the data to do analysis on it, but he wants, to, he wants very low latency on it. So he starts doing analysis on the production database. And you all know what that means for the serving, uh, the web fronts that need needs quick services. So we actually need to, to architecture something that, that can sort of cater for all these needs. <coughs> and I, I promise you Postgres will, will be part of it and also a lot of NoSQL databases. So we, we want something where we can do functions of all data. We want all of the data of Klarna poured into this system and you want to be able to express functions on all this data. We want it to support scheme on read. Basically, that means we pour any data in and then we apply a schema to it when we want to query it. This means we can start by pouring data in and we can just use a small trickle of that data in the beginning of our production and then start expanding on that schema. Compared to a relational database where you actually need to comply to schema when you put data in the system. Which means if you wanted more data from day one, that data would be lost to you if you, if you, <coughs> if you later on discover that. Sorry, we want it to be highly scalable on a lot of levels. It should be scaling on the processing, it should be scaling on the front ends. We want it to cater for machine fault tolerance, or it should be machine fault tolerant, meaning one machine breaks down, shouldn't break the whole system. My one part of the network goes down, shouldn't break the whole system. But also it should be human fault tolerant. I never met a developer, I never met a product manager that managed to put up requirements up front for a system that holds through the whole life cycle of that system. I never met a developer that didn't write a bug. You want to fix these bugs. You want to uh, develop these uh, models. You want to evolve the system. We need an architecture that can cater for that, where, you can, where, where we can actually uh, evolve our schemas over time and uh, the way we process data. So <clears throat> Nathan Mars, a guy working on Trip, Twitter, he wrote, uh, wrote up this blog post in uh, 2011, which called How to Beat the Cap Theorem. 
we're going to talk about the cap theorem in, in a couple of seconds. Uh, 2014, Jay Krebs on LinkedIn, he blogs about the pitfalls of Lambda, and he proposes an alternative uh, architecture called uh, Kappa, and his blog is called Questioning the Lambda Architecture. So there's a couple of, a couple of years between there, and, and Jay Krebs actually had uh, a lot of experience with implementing Lambda architectures when he wrote up his, his Kappa blog. So these are the two architectures we're going to compare. But so it's it's actually started with the Cap theorem in, in back in 2000, when a guy called uh, Eric Brewer said that if you have a distributed system, you can't have both availability and full consistency. You have to choose one of them. That later on became the Cap theorem, <coughs> and Cap stands for C as in consistency meaning all clients should have the same view of the data. If I choose consistency, that means if I write data to my database in China, I should, uh, the next millisecond, be able to read exactly the same data in the States. Well, not millisecond probably, because you would lose that, but wherever I read data after I wrote it, I should always read the same consistent data. Availability means that all clients may always read and write as, so, as, as long as they actually contact a, a functioning node in the system. And partition tolerance means that although I might lose parts of my network or parts of my nodes, my system continues to operate. Of course, if I lose all my nodes, it goes down. Then it's not a partition anymore, it's a total system failure. <clears throat> but so, so Brewer said, you can only choose two out of these three, you can never ever have all three. And putting it the other way around, that means that if I choose consistency and availability, that means that any network or machine failure might kill my system. If I choose partition tolerance and availability, and I discard consistency, that means I might read inconsistent data. I write data in China, and it might take a, a while until I can actually read that in, in the States. Being China, you might never actually be able to read it, but that's another thing. <laughs> <coughs> or probably the other way around. If I write data in the States, I might never read it in China. Never mind. Uh, if I choose partition tolerance and consistency, that means that my data might actually become unavailable at times. So choose any two, never three. Uh, and of course, in a distributed system, you're always subject to two partition tolerance. So that was, that's, that's what Brew meant. <coughs> You choose consistency or availability because you always have to choose partition tolerance. So let's place uh, some well-known uh, data processing systems on this map. And first we have the old traditional RDBMS like a Postgres or an Oracle database. Those are traditionally built on a one server solution, which means they actually don't have partition tolerance. So they can actually choose both consistency and availability. HDFS, on the other hand, is partition tolerant and consistent. It's not always available. Why? Because <coughs> HDFS has a name node and it's a single point of failure. All transactions go th through that name node. If that one goes down, it will keep consistency of the data, but it won't make it, uh, it, won't make it available to you until the name, no no name node is up and running again. And uh, traditionally, you would place DynamoDB on the partition tolerant and the accessible part of this map. Uh, because, I mean, it was basically uh, best effort consistent. However, in later releases, you can actually, as a client, choose if I want to do a fully consistent read uh, and, and then, I mean, lose some availability, or I want a very quick read and then I might lose consistency. So a lot of these NoSQL databases coming, they actually can be configured to run in different modes of, of the two pieces of the, of the three pieces of the CAP theorem. Interesting. I think uh, Kafka can also be configured to be either PA or PC, <coughs> depending on setup. So basically, again, what Brewer said was, uh, if there is a possibility of network partitions, you cannot have both availability and consistency. But Robin here is very persistent. He says, is the, aren't there any system that can actually provide all three parts of CAP? Um, Batman, being well known for his sarcasm, says, yes, you can find those. Ask any salesperson 
or, or a popular magazine. By the way, what, what, what is, what is uh, Robin's pants made of? I, I have no idea, actually. It's fish scale or whatever. It's very, very nice looking anyway. All right, so that was the cap theorem, and that was sort of the base, basis of Nathan Marr's blog post. He said, how can we beat the cap theorem? That's why we had to go into that part of it. But then he says, you can't. Yay, why? So, so he says, you can't beat the cap theorem, but you can actually write up an architecture where you can isolate it and, and put the different uh, complexity, complexities of cap in different boxes in your architecture. And by that, you can actually reason about cap and you can choose to have CA somewhere and CP some otherwhere in your system, which means you can reason about the SLA and what happens in, if that goes down, yada, yada. But he took it one step further and said, I, I, don't, want, I, I don't just want a, an architecture that caters for, for machine fault tolerance. I want it to also cater for human fault tolerance. I want my system to, to be able to, uh, my process systems to be able to, to evolve with demands or bug fixes. <clears throat> and to do that, he, he figured that I, I need to be able to recompute my whole model as many times as I want to. And to be able to recompute my model from the beginning of time up until now, I need an immutable master data set. I need data that's only appended. It's never updated or deleted. It's only added to. So, yes. so recomputation and immutability is two really strong uh, things in these, in, in these architectures we're going to look at. So he figured, I got new data on one side. There. And I got a couple of analysts and a lot of applications on the other side that want to take part of this data. I'm going to do that by a serving layer. The serving layer has a very low latency and it's, it's going to be very responsive. A typical uh, Postgres or uh, an H-based key value store. I'm going to feed data into the serving layer through my batch layer. The batch layer is a huge monster that takes all data, all the mutable data is stored actually in the, in the batch layer, takes all that data, computes a huge batch every day or every hour, but with a high latency. We're talking hours, days, months, years basically, hopefully not years, uh, and pushes that one to the serving layer as a, as a big chunk. And this big chunk, whenever it arrives at the serving layer, it replaces all that was ever known before that in the serving layer. So the total truth is in the batch layer. And that's recomputed every day or every hour or, I mean, hours, days, weeks. <clears throat> so it's immutable. It can do functional data. That means the computation can be very accurate, but it has a very high latency. And, and as, as we see, the serving layer was supposed to have a very low latency. So how does that fit? It doesn't if you don't add a speed layer as well. So Nathan thought, let, let's, case, let's cater for real time. Let's, let's, let's add a speed layer. And the speed layer, it can do a function of the latest data. It can't do a function of all data. You, you can't have all data in memory. And the speed layer is supposed to be fast. So it does function of, of the latest data only, but with a very low data latency. And it feeds this data into the serving layer and lets this data offset the latest batch. So this means that now we have a model in the serving layer that's built up from the big batch and then offset it with the speed layer. The speed layer might be slightly less accurate because it can only do function for latest data, but it has much lower latency. So with this, we now have a low latency serving layer. But uh, Nathan wanted to also be able to reason around this, so let's reason around it. What happens if I lose my batch layer? Well, the batch layer pushed big batches once a day, right? So the serving layer, it probably already has a batch if, it's been, if we've been continuously up and running. So then it has a big chunk of data and the speed layer is still working. So it will continuously offset the, the data in the serving layer. So what do I lose? Well, I lose accuracy because the speed layer was less accurate because it can only do function of the latest data. What happens if I lose the speed layer then? <coughs> Uh, then I lose latency. I have the batch layer. It pushes big data chunks once a day, once a week. 
But now I can't offset it with my latest data. So now my latency is up until that time I get the next batch. So I lose latency until I get the speed layer, speed layer up and running again. What if I lose my serving layer? Then my web fronts, of course, can't work, right? Well, the nice thing with this architecture is that the serving layer is totally reproducible from the speed and batch layer, which means they also scale very well horizontally. So if I lose one serving layer, I just redirect my analyst and applications to another serving layer, if I, if I deploy two of them, at least. All right, so uh, by all means, feel free to ask quest questions at any time during the, the presentation. Sorry for not saying that earlier. So let, let, let's look at the use case uh, at Klarna where we implemented Lambda. So what's the, what's the state at, at Klarna? Well, we have a lot of uh, different data producers, lots of small services producing data. We have quite a lot of external data coming into the system as well in, in terms of credit uh, assessment or credit scoring and stuff like that. We have a lot of formats. I mean, these, these external services, we can't really decide on that format. And we also have a lot of services with different age within Klarna that produce a lot of different schemas and formats of the data. We also have a ton of different data consumers. We're a really data-driven company. The core business of Klarna is doing credit, credit assessment based on data. So there's a, there's, a, there's a ton of consumers and we have a culture of, of, of using data to try to take decisions. And a big problem at Klarna for us is that we have a split brain. We, have a, we basically have two big production systems. We have uh, the old and still well-functioning system and we have the new and well-functioning system. These two systems, uh, they, they, there's like, like a firewall between, between these two systems' data. Uh, and that's, that's like a huge split brain. If I want the total number of orders at Klarna, I actually need to go ask two systems. So that's also something we needed to solve. And a lot of our use cases uh, actually take a lot of sources into consideration. So a lot of our use cases are a function of many sources. So we're going to look at RAS, which means risk as a service. This is the actual um, data model that, that services our uh, web fronts that actually takes the credit decision in real time. I think it's about three seconds per credit decision, or the last time I heard anyway. So the data flows from left to right in this graph. Uh, we have a couple of different data formats. formats. We have the EU sanction list, the PCASH, the TX, BICS, and ROS. EU sanction list is basically a list provided by some organization in EU with a lot of uh, people that you can't do business with. Basically, Hitler and uh, yeah, those guys, bad people. The PCASH is, is a big chunk of, of data on disk, basically, or archived on disk that are all the credit lookups that we've done on customers. We need to take these into consideration because we don't want to do new lookups every time someone tries to buy something. That's, for one thing, costly to do a lookup, and it's also, I think, it's not legal to do as many lookups as you want to, so we need to keep track on the lookups we've done. You have the TX database. That's an Oracle database, and, and that's one part of this big split brain I talked about. One, that's our new system producing a lot of data down in Oracle. We have the Bix uh, stream, uh, Kafka stream. That's the old system producing a ton of data uh, on Kafka. And we have the RAS stream, which actually, actually is the feedback from the RAS application back into the system again. This data is fed into the batch layer and it's processed by a language we call HiveQL, or we don't call it, it's actually called HiveQL. We call it something else. <laughs> it's basically a SQL dialect on, on Hadoop. So through this SQL dialect, we can join and query and ag aggregate this data, and we can then push the result of these queries on a daily or hourly basis out to Postgres, which acts as a serving layer. And the Postgres then has, uh, of course, uh, it's highly queryable from the ROS application. But <coughs> seeing that BICs and ROS, they are actually streams, 
and they contain data that is really well, that is latency sensitive to the end result. So there's a speed layer added to this picture as well. The speed layer is built in Java Spring. It could be built in something cool like Spark or Flink or whatever, but it's, it's built in Java Spring and that works. Depends on how advanced aggregations you want to do actually on the stream. So these two guys, these two streams are fed into the speed layer and there's a continuous offset done on the batch in the server layer. So now ROS has some of the most important variables continuously updated with low latency. So th this is like a, a schoolbook Lambda architecture. But, but then it, it's probably interesting as well to see how do we actually organize around this, who writes what and yada yada. So first off, we have the data consumer. And at Klarna, we said early on that the speed layer is going to be fairly domain uh, specific. So we, we won't uh, have a general speed layer. We will actually let the, the data consumer write its own speed layer. We also let the, the, the consumer own its own serving layer because the consumer knows best whatever capabilities he wants in his serving layer. He also writes his own transformations because, I mean, those needs to fit his business and they need to fit whatever serving layer he's choosing. If he chooses a key value store, he can't really do relational database stuffish here and the other way around. <clears throat> so all these things are owned by the consumer of the data. Uh, then we created a team in Uppsala, uh, or two teams now, that, uh, that owns the operation of the batch layer and owns all frameworks that the consumers and producers use to get data into the, uh, the batch layer and to get data out of the batch layer and also transform the data within the batch layer. And finally, we have all the producers. They own their own data sets in the, data, in the batch layer. Uh, they, own, they own all the, um, uh, all the knowledge around the data. What does my this field actually mean? All that is owned by the data producers. So we try to keep in, in Uppsala, we try to keep very domain agnostic. Otherwise, we would drown in, in questions around domain data. Uh, we try to instead let consumers and producers talk to each other about what data is available. Available. Uh, I want this data as well. Can you make that available, etc. Right. What, what time is it? Oh, there's a clock. I can do this. <laughs> So we learned a lesson. Loading is hard. Getting data from the batch layer to the, to the serving layer, that's, that's a really painful process. Um, so we have this, uh, whoop, that's not the laser button. <laughs> that's the laser button. So we have this uh, big batch layer pushing a daily big batch of uh, being the function of all data to the serving layer. It says SL, don't, it means serving layer. Um, we have a customer called SL, that's why I'm trying to be specific. And that worked fine when we, when we were doing this machine-to-machine uh, -machine in the same data center. But once we moved to the cloud, this didn't work anymore. This batch was too big. This was too big spike on the network. Uh, and it actually sort of stopped all other, other applications in the, in the cloud. So we funneled that data traffic, and that meant that the batch could not be pushed daily anymore because it took like 30 hours to actually stream it over to the cloud. So it wasn't a, anymore, it wasn't a feasible solution anymore, so we had to solve that. But someone actually already solved it for us. Yay! It's this guy called Kleppmann. Kleppmann, he's German, I think. He uh, wrote up this um, small plugin to Postgres, uh, he calls bottled water. And what that one does, it streams a Postgres, it replicates a Postgres database to a Kafka topic. We thought we, we might be able to do the same. And we did. So we took, now we took yesterday's state, yesterday's batch, and today's batch, and we created daily delta. Those deltas are, I mean, from what we've seen, they are like, so small you can't even compare them to the full batch. 
This daily delta is then pushed as updates and uh, deletes to the topic, the Kafka topic. And now the serving layer can get the full state of the batch by consuming the topic from uh, point zero to up to now. That means the topic holds the full state of the latest batch produced in the data vault. Now moving to the cloud, this means that we replicate, or what we do in the cloud is that we replicate this topic to another topic in the cloud, and now the serving layers in the cloud can read locally or more closer to, to themselves uh, the same data that was produced here. Right, so moving on to Kappa, or Jacob's beef with Lambda, as I like to call it. So uh, Jay Krebs, uh, he wrote his blog roughly three years after Nathan Mars wrote his blog. He worked at LinkedIn and he had a lot of experience with Lambda at that point in time. <clears throat> also, uh, on the streaming scene, there had been a lot of uh, changes that really boomed. So there, there was a ton of new tools that actually was now fit for production like Kafka and Spark, Storm. So streaming had really become... Um, production grade during these three years uh, since Nathan proposed Lambda. So he thought that uh, the worst thing with Lambda was to have a speed layer and a batch layer trying to uh, do the same logic. This means you have two code bases in production that needs to do the same thing. That is really hard to maintain. It's also really hard to operate because when you see something in the serving layer, and you want to find out where did that come from, you need to now debug two pipelines to understand where it came from. And these technologies are really different as well. So he, that, was, that was like a big, big block of him. It didn't, he, they couldn't make it happen, really. What he did like, though, was the immutability of the batch layer and the replayability or the, the reproducibility of the data processing. So he liked that. But he, he, he didn't like the batch layer, and streaming was the new cool thing. So he thought, if I take what's good, and I beef up the speed layer with that, then I don't need a batch layer anymore. And it became the cap architecture. He formed four principles for his cap architecture, saying, everything is a stream. If you push batches every day, that's basically a stream of very big messages. Everything is a stream, according to Jay. And theoretically, it is. In practice, it might not be for, any, for all companies. Um, and he installed the immutable master data. That was all good. He wanted that. He wanted the replay functionality. Uh, but also, he wanted this to really be a single analytics framework. This was really important to him. He talked about KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So simplicity was a big drive in this architecture, which is a really good drive for an architecture, if you ask me. Right, so to, to the left now, he has his data stream. It's not, it's not new data anymore. It's, it's actually a data stream. It has to be a stream. And it feeds this stream continuously into his stream processing ending, being Storm, Kappa, uh, Storm or, or Spark or, or Java for that matter. And that one continuously updates the serving layer in a specific table, and then you have applications and analysts reading for that one. This is, I mean, you, you now get the concept. It's fairly sim similar to the Lambda architecture. Now we wanted the recomputability as well. That is done by actually just starting a new updated job in the stream processing layer. Reading from the data stream, which is still immutable and canonical, so it holds all the data, that's, that's the full truth of what you ever did. You let that job run, it will take a while, it will have to catch up, it will, because it's, produced, it's doing function of all data now, actually. Uh, and eventually, when it's done, it will push to a new table in the serving layer. Once that one is up to speed, you redirect your applications and analysts to that one, and you kill the old job. So now you have managed to actually um, cater for this human error that, that Nathan wanted to cater for. You can update your models or fix, fix your bugs in production. Right, so let's take a quick look at how ASB Gems, uh, a company that I found on the internet, drew up their cap architecture. Uh, pretty, pretty. The, I added the colors, by the way. So, so, so white and 
boring before. Right, so at the bottom, they have their Hadoop and Teradata uh, clusters. This is sort of the master data set. And they probably do some processing and stuff here as well. I didn't find much on this. I talked a bit to the architect, but yeah, so I'm, I'm winging this a bit. In the middle, they have their all important uh, streaming platform. It's built with Kafka and Spark. So Kafka has, like, a, in this example I talked to him, they have like a buffer of like um, three months or something in Kafka. So they can do recomputation re three months back in time fairly easy by, by just re rerunning the, the Kafka log. Anything longer than that, if you want a, a bigger event horizon than, than three months, then you have to go down to Hadoop and feed that data back into this system to be able to compute, recompute that data. So that's a bit, so, a bit of a hassle. It's, uh, it just sounds a bit steampunky to me. <clears throat> At the top here, they have their serving layers. And as you see, there's a bunch of different technologies as, a ser as serving layers. That's really nice. And applications feeding on these serving layers. Uh, a neat thing with Spark and Kafka together is that you can actually query Spark directly. They seem to do that with their sort of back office applications. So uh, if I, I'm going to take a guess here, but they want to provide a really robust and high SLA on their, on their front applications. So they have their robust and nice uh, isolated server layers up here, but on the, on the log search and monitoring and stuff like that, they can provide a slightly lower SLA, so they probably query the, the Spark directly, the Spark framework. And uh, they said that uh, for them, the real advantage of the Kappa, Kappa architecture is not about efficiency at all. I mean, it's not about efficiency of the system. It's not about performance of the system. It is allowing your, your developers and, and, and analysts and testers to actually write good software that on a single processing framework. Kappa is much simpler to work with. And that's a huge gain that Jay wanted, and ASP Gems confirmed that gain. But who's winning? Should we all go Kappa, or should we stick with Lambda? Well, if, if you look at the common stuff by, with Kappa and Lambda, and ask me about it, and I'm standing here, so I'm going to answer that question. Uh, the most important part of, the, of these two architectures are the isolated server layers. That allows you to build really scalable serving layers that can scale horizontally over the, I mean, and, and globally and, and feed your web applications with robust uh, data. Both these two, two architectures strive to do that. And, and as I said, I think that's the most important piece of this architecture. On the other side of these two architectures, this, they also show that they are immutable. Uh, they do uh, scheme on read. You can do function of all data, maybe with some modification on, 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 on the Kappa architecture, and you can do redundability. So these are the good parts of both systems. What's bad with Lambda then? Well, we said it. Two, two code bases are hard to maintain, uh, and two systems are hard to operate, or two pipelines. Uh, the batch load really puts a, a huge stress on the server layer and the networks. So if you're doing Lambda, you need to do some sort of optimization, as we figured out we had to as well. And you do a lot of unnecessary recomputations. Every day you do a function of all data, uh, although it might not have changed that much. If you're doing really simple linear uh, aggregates, then, then you might just have, to, I mean, you could get away with actually just doing incremental processing, but Lambda as a, as a base plate doesn't do that. So that's also an optimization you would have to build on your own. And that adds, adds complexity, of course. So what's, what's bad with, with Kappa then? Well, Kappa only operates on streams and reality is not everything is a stream. It can be a stream, but it isn't. So that's, that's a con for, for Kappa. And also big volumes uh, require some archiving and replaying that I haven't seen really good solutions for yet. I'm sure they will come. But today it's more a steampunk approach to feed data back, um, real old data back into uh, Kafka. Thanks. Um, to be able to, to, to replay a, a big event horizon with, with a big event horizon. Putting them next to each other. The, the good parts now, 
Kappa presents a smaller code base. That's always a, a really good thing. Uh, the stack is also smaller. That's also a really good thing. The load is much more linear. Loading to the serving layer happens, con happens continuously. Of course, you will have some sort of spike when you redeploy your process and, and do the full reprocessing. But uh, it's argued for that that will probably even out if you have a lot of different pipelines. Um, and, and of course, the, the batch layer could also even out, but we tend to see that everybody wants to wait for an update and then push the daily data to the serving layer, which means that everybody tries to push at the same time during, during, the, um, during the day. And Kappa only recomputes at need. Uh, as I said, Lambda recomputes all the time. Lambda, on the other hand, uh, other hand, is slightly more accurate. It has a more purer function for all. It can really do that in the batch layer, whereas streaming can't actually do that. It caters better for data variety, and it caters better for data volume. It's easier to handle weird contracts and, and big volumes in Lambda. And also I like with Lambda is that, uh, that the full replay is actually part of the normal fl flow with Lambda. I don't. I, I personally have a problem with architectures where you do, where where you have a normal flow, and then then when when you want to do a, a recomputation, then you actually have to start pulling levers and run in the right direc direction and, and sort of spin around three times to make it happen. If you do something something that wrong, something unexpected happens. So I like it to be part of the normal flow because then it's it's well tested and well well proven. So can we have cap at Klarna? Can it replace Lambda? Mm. Yes. Can it do it today? No. We have a couple of really big relational databases that we could start streaming, of course, but stream, streaming a relational database doesn't get you an event stream. It gets sort of a data shift stream, and that's, that's not good enough to actually uh, process uh, in any streaming framework yet. So we probably need to rebuild some stuff to, to sort of replace Lambda but nothing's stopping you from actually starting doing Kappa. If you have a use case where you're only dependent on today or the streaming data, then of course you can build a Kappa architecture. It is much simpler in a lot of senses, so use that one, please, if it's feasible. Uh, but then I, I think I, I see a risk with Kappa, and that's... Since you have this, usually have this sort of Kafka buffer with, let's say, three months or six months buffer, uh, a simple solution to getting a, a larger event horizon would be to sort of start creating a, a stateful serving layer that remembers more than is actually on the stream. That is a huge risk. If you start doing that, then you lose the full scalability of the serving layer and you lose like the greatest capability of both these architectures. So, some further reading, if you want to read these blogs about beating cap theorem and, and the creating the cap, uh, and the cap architecture, just read those. If you're interested more in the cap theorem, there's ton to read, of course, but Brewer's cap theorem by Julian Brown is also fun to read, so that one you will actually manage to read. It uses references to punk to, to be fun, and that's fun. And also look at Kleppmann's work, it's, it's really interesting. And also, come to Uppsala. We're happy to talk to you about both Kappa and, and Lambda and try to convince us. We will try to convince you and we will try to change this for the better. And now, questions. <laughs> <laughs>